Good morning, my name is Maria Jose Torres and I'm going to present you my internship report which name is a translator beyond translation, copy editing and proof reading scientific and technical texts. I decided to do an internship in, translating, in translation because I wanted to experience this field from the inside. Therefore, I started looking for an internship that would allow me to develop all knowledge I acquired during my studies and that was related to the specialized branch of translation that best fitted my interests, which are translation of scientific and technical texts. Thus, after evaluating different options, I found Economia, a journal of the Faculty of Economic and Social Sciences of the University of Los Andes, ULA. Economia is a biannual journal that disseminates original research papers in the fields of economics, business administration, statistics, political sciences, and accountancy. Economia is edited by the Instituto de Investigaciones Económicas y Sociales, the IES, which is attached to FASES, ULA. To make the journal's objective possible, Economia counts on an editorial team, which includes two editors, an editorial board, an advisory board, an editor assistant, a layout designer, and a translator. I took the translator role and during my internships, I carry out the following activities. I copy edited and proofread 15 papers in Spanish. I translated one scientific research paper and one technical text. I localized a web page of the ES and I created a terminological and bilingual glossary. Now I want to speak about my academic and professional reflections. I will focus on the main activities I carry out, which are copy editing and proofreading and translation of scientific and technical texts. So during my internships at Economia, I realized that in the publishing process of a scholarly journal, to have tr a translator as a member of the staff is essential because he or she is qualified to carry out relevant activities other than translating that may add substantial value to the finished product. Two of such uh, essential activities are copy editing and proofreading. Copy editing, it is the, mm, well, it refers to make a paper more consistent and readable. And proofreading, it refers to focus on examining surface errors as punctuation and spelling. So I realized that in the digital process of any publication, it is important or is essential um, these tags because they improve the readability and clarity of the content, as well as the author's and publisher's reputation as an accurate and authoritative source of information. Moreover, I realized that um, there are some essential skills required to do copy editing and proofreading. So according to Serrano, um, these skills are the linguistic competence, documentation, and common sense. I could relate these skills with the, with the translation competence defined by PACTE. Um, the translation competence, it is the underlying system of knowledge required to translate. The translation competence comprises five subcompetences, and I think that three of them, the bilingual, the instrumental, and the strategic subcompetences, are the required to do copy editing and proofreading. I'm going to show you why. The bilingual competence because the copy editor and proofreader must be familiar with the knowledge, with the language he or she is working with, since they need to read, write, they need to do right and fast decisions in Texas. The instrumental suit competence because the copy editor and proofreader must be knowledgeable about how to do research and documentation in order to make um, to make changes in the text texts they are working. And the strategic suit competence because the copy editor and proofreader must be open-minded, objective, and adaptable to the text's characteristics and the customer's instructions. For example, I worked on a paper in which the author didn't use an academic or scientific style. On the contrary, he wrote the text as a legal document. He used many commas, bold letters, italics. He wrote long paragraphs. So, Using the bilingual suit competence, I could remove all stylistic faults that impede reading and comp comprehend the text. Um, with the instrumental suit competence, I could make changes in the wording and spelling of some terms in which I realized there was a mistake in, 
and the uh, strategic suit competence I could analyze and evaluate the text um, and improve its format and style and sentence structure. Besides copy editing and proofreading, I worked as a translator for Economia, so I carry out the translation of scientific and technical texts. It was a positive experience because I could put into practice my training in translation, but in, nevertheless, um, I faced some difficulties in the translation process, especially in the comprehension phase, and since I wasn't related to the field of economic field, I had to face um, so many unknown terminology, so um, it impeded um, the comprehension. So to face uh, these difficulties, I counted on um, sectional support and feedback from, from professors and researchers who specialize in the field of knowledge. Nevertheless, as a professional translator, I was expected to um, carry out these, um, well, to solve these difficulties by myself, so I have to become a meticulous documentalist in order to properly uh, comprehend the source text. In this way, I put into practice my documentation uh, competence in order to write or to choose, uh, write and accurate uh, sources of information. For example, when I received the first translation task, a technical text in the field of experimental economics, I um, search vulgarization articles about public good games, um, which was a text topic. So I chose a parallel text, one that resembles the source text in the topic, communicative functions and context, and in this way I could understand understand the um, the text, um, well, the the topic, uh, the definitions. I found um, how. Um, how the text, how the, the this game functions, who who was uh, who were the, the who were the players, what were the rules. So um, I could proceed to the next phase, which was the expression phase. Nevertheless, I still found uh, some difficulties. Uh, so I consulted specialized and terminological dictionaries, as well as human resources the ES professors and researchers in experimental economics. Moreover, as I was working with uh, technical text, I used some translation strategies and tools, such as working with a translation memory, because it would help me to reach consistencies, cons consistency and uh, uh, effectiveness in communication. Okay. Now I want to speak about um, my cultural essay, um, which title is The Use of Anglicism in the Special Language of Economics, Blockchain or Cadena de Bloques. When working at Economia, I realized that the Spanish language of economics has a peculiar characteristic. Uh, specialists and, and researchers discourse is plenty of Anglicism. What is an Anglicism? An Anglicism is certainly it's the linguistic borrowing from English uh, to Spanish um, or any other language. So the presence of Anglicism in, the Spani in Spanish is mainly associated to the constant cultural contact with English-speaking countries. Um, since the 16th century, um, there has been um, well, there have been many different reasons as the um, territorial disputes and conquests. In that time, uh, the influence of one language over the other was balanced because they shared the same prestige and power. Nevertheless, nowadays, there is a substantial difference. English influence is um, or has been considerable not only over Spanish but over every language to the extent that English has owned the, the status of a global language, since Anglo-Saxon nations influence the world through culture and power. We can see it in the daily press, in industrial and commercial interests, in the scientific world, in the movie industry, in tourism and sports, and in the diplomatic relationships between English and Spanish-speaking countries. So. The borrowing from English terms into Spanish is an expected result 
um, because of such daily contact. We can see it in Venezuela, for example. We usually notice the presence of Anglicism in everyday language. People say cake, makeup, store, outfit, home office, manager, online, post, trendy. So, um, somehow Spanish speakers prefer using the English term rather than their Spanish equivalent. However, um, the excessive linguistic uh, borrowing uh, isn't considered as a formal register. That's why it is more common to find Anglicism in everyday language. Nevertheless, uh, it doesn't mean that Anglicism are not common in special languages, because Anglicism in Spanish are significantly frequent and relevant in special languages as computer science, science, medicine, uh, science and technology. So, as in everyday language, special languages might be influenced by science, technology and politics, which are widespread in English. So, the Spanish language of economics is not an exception. It will always be plenty of Anglicism because it is in constant contact with English. Since, um, or because of, uh, the capacity of creating and disseminating neologism and the prestige that English give to the economic discourse. A neologism, it is a lexica, lexical or semantic item created to name new inventions or concepts. So most of denominations are expressed in English because um, Spanish and because English speaking countries as the United States, um, they have been dominating the scientific world. So specialists and researchers, they, they are in contact with English because they need to fulfill the necessity of talking about a new concept that has no corresponding term in their ta target language. That's why um, the Spanish, um, um, yes, these um, special languages, they will be plenty of Anglicism. For example, in the economic discourse, we can see it in the financial, business, and technological, because of the financial, business, and technological innovations. For example, the term crowdfunding, it has no easy or correspondent equivalent in Spanish. So that's why it was incorporated into Spanish as a necessary neologism. However, um, there exists uh, luxury neologism. They have a translation or equivalent in Spanish, but they might be still incorporated as a non adapted Anglicism for prestige reasons. So, for example, the term blockchain. Blockchain, it has, um, it has been translated as cadena de bloques. Nevertheless, um, using, well, uh, people, uh, researchers and specialists, they prefer using the English term. And it is explained because using the original term is in most of the context considered more technical or influential. So, when I was working with Economia, I also found that English long words al were alternating with their Spanish equivalents in the same text as synonyms. For example, I found uh, terms like uh, family business and empresa familiar, fintech and te tecnología financiera, startup and er Empresa Emergente, Trading and Negociación Bursátil, Project Finance and Financiamiento de Proyectos. So, according to De La Cruz and Tejedor, this alternation between English and Spanish equivalents is because glamour and prestige seem to be linked to the denominations in English. And this is um, something um, explained and understood as linguistic borrowing. So, um, sorry, linguistic prestige. So, linguistic pre prestige, it is the dis degree of, uh, of esteem and social value attached by members of a speech community to certain languages, dialects, or features of variety. So, um, the linguistic prestige um, is seen in the Spanish language of economics. So, researchers and specialists explain that by including English long words and forms into their text, researchers and specialists are making them more influential and prestigious.